Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, let's get started. My name is Pavitra Vasudevan. I'm a assistant professor here at UT Austin. Um, I'll be serving as a moderator for this session called Conversations on Caring. This panel addresses both care work and the essential work themes of the Pop-Up Institute. Um, and it's part of the Rappaport Center's Pop-Up Institute's Beyond the Future of Work, which goes through June 11th. So before we introduce the panelists today, some logistics. Um, this is a Zoom meeting as opposed to a webinar so that the presenters can see the audience during the Q&A. Um, for now, we'd like to ask you to turn your cameras off and please ensure your mics are muted. Um, and you're welcome to turn your video back on in the Q&A if you'd like. During the conversation, um, please feel free to type general comments um, in the chat, um, but also since we're not all great at, at multitasking, please send any questions that you have for the panelists directly to me, um, or you can raise your hand. If you're watching from YouTube, you can enter your questions in the YouTube chat and our student team member will pass them along to me. Also, we are live tweeting the event um, so folks can join the conversation on Twitter, um, Sarah or Liza will be dropping in links um, for the Twitter handle and the chat, as well as links to the panelists' bios. So this session, Conversations on Caring, is building from work on public health, care work, and racial capitalism. And the panelists will be discussing the lengthy and ongoing crisis in caring labor that's been exacerbated by the current pandemic. And um, also hopefully have a vibrant conversation on reimagining care work. Um, our panelists today, uh, Libby McClure, is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She recently completed a year contributing to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services COVID-19 response team as an occupational epidemiologist. Carrie Fresher is a, Southern, is a Southerner, an abolitionist, and an assistant professor of geography at the University of Washington. Her work focuses on low-wage food and agricultural labor in the US South, racial capitalism, carceral geographies, and the black radical tradition. Sharmila Rudrapa teaches sociology at the University of Texas at Austin and directs the South Asia Institute. And Snehal Patel is an organizer, activist, and an internal medicine physician, assistant professor of medicine and population health at Dell Med School at the University of Texas at Austin. So I will now hand it off, I believe our first speaker is um, Sharmila, are you going first? I'm, yeah. I'm going first very briefly Great. and then, you know, uh, Libby's going to take over. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for attending our panel. Um, uh, we are just as excited to hear how this panel, you know, flows out just as you are. Uh, because in our conversations yesterday when the four of us panelists got together uh, to think through what a panel would, would, would look like, uh, we very, quickly came to realize that we couldn't quite settle on, not just with each other, but within ourselves as well, how exactly we approach care work. In all four of our presentations today, you'll hear some of the questions and the grappling that we went through uh, yesterday, but also what we've been doing uh, for so much of our work. So in all four of our presentations, you'll hear us talk through the ways by which we are recasting care, uh, we're recasting what we mean by work and perhaps reform, uh, reframe care work itself. Our public conversation here today is an invitation to engage with us and with each other in this group in conceptualizing care, work, and care work. Rather than dividing the conversation up into productive and reproductive realms, or the labors involved around biological versus social reproduction a fundamental starting point for us on this panel is that an ethic of care is an approach to personal, social, and political life that begins with a recognition that all human beings need and receive care and give care to others. So I'm hoping that is the sort of conversation we, uh, uh, our work fosters, uh, but also the conversation here. Uh, that is what we're hoping to do. Uh, so Libby, if you wanted to start off and take it from here, then I can jump back in later. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation and it's an honor to be here with y'all. Um, and I 
Um, just thought I would give some background on my own training and some of the, the framing that I'm coming to the conversation with. Um, so I'm trained in a quantitative field of epidemiology, which is inherently oftentimes pretty reductive and likes to consider itself to be objective, but then has an underlying valuing of certain perspectives over others. Um, and I come to this group um, through Pavitra. I, we've been working together for a number of years in a collaborative project with um, a concerned citizens of West Baden group, a community organization in Baden, North Carolina. They're a collective of uh, former workers in an aluminum smelting facility and some of their family members, as well as the uh, North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. And we found through this process that most of the epidemiology research on aluminum smelting work and health really didn't reflect um, worker and community experiences. Um, specifically, we found almost nothing looking at race and gender disparities in work exposures and health. Um, and found that most of the, the research was industry run, um, especially that coming out of the, the United States. And so um, through that, we began um, using the, the perspective of, of racial capitalism to analyze sort of what we were seeing and hearing from, from community members. Um, and so um, we recently came out with a, a commentary with co-authors Sneha Patel, who's also on the panel, as well as um, Zinzi Bailey and Whitney Robinson. Um, and we talk about how the epidemiology of COVID-19 in the US has focused on individuals, biology and behaviors, um, despite the centrality of occupational environments in the spread of this virus. Um, and in our commentary, we argue that this demonstrates collusion between the field of epidemiology and racial capitalism because it obscures the structural influences um, on those disparities which absolves industries of responsibility for worker safety. Um, so the, the term racial capitalism was coined by Cedric Robinson, and it refers to the centrality of race in structuring social and labor hierarchies in capitalist economies. Um, geographer Laura Polito says this system ensures a quote, vulnerable supply of low wage workers through dual wage systems, racially exclusive labor unions, racialized divisions of labor, sharecropping and related practices. Um, also, we drew on Dorothy Roberts scholarship um, on the history of race and medicine. And she describes how focus on underlying health conditions and behavioral risk factors allows society to both ignore um, how disease is caused by political inequality and to justify an equal system by pointing to the inherent racial differences that disease supposedly reveals. Um, and we looked at an empirical example using lung function inspired by our work with the concerned citizens of West Baden um, and how uh, race corrections in the algorithms determining qualification for workers' compensation related to lung function injury um was um race corrected in a way that um hid the um occupational based um origins of race disparities in in lung function and so um under the system of racial capitalism black workers experience more work-related health damage because they're concentrated into riskier less protective jobs and so the corrections understate the extent of their damaged health, um, disproportionately more valuable to industry than corrections that understate the workplace impacts on less exposed populations. And then for the rest of the commentary, we tell the stories of key industries that are implicated in the spread of COVID-19 in the US and argue that the risks associated with these workplaces are uh, patterned by race, ethnicity, and immigrant status. Um, and so I think I'll leave it there and we can get into some of the more specifics as we get into the conversation more deeply. Thanks, Libby. Um, okay, um, so basically I'm going to read from my presentation and apologize for that. Um, 
What I want to do is basically make two points. Uh, so let me begin. Um, and I'm hoping you know, that you can get to the two points, but I'll conclude as well to reiterate and highlight those two points. Let me begin. About 13 years ago in 2008, I began working on transnational surrogacy in India. Working with women and men who exchange wages for pregnancy and childbirth trouble the easy divisions that are made between productive wage labor, so essential to the sustenance of, econ of the economic sphere, and reproductive unwage labor, so essential for the sustenance of family and community. Most of the 70 surrogate mothers I worked with were garment workers, recruited from sweatshops, making t-shirts, shirts, and jeans for the likes of Gap, Banana Republic, and H&M. The women that I met with spoke of the extraordinary forms of discipline they faced and the punishment meted out on the assembly line, the sweatshop, the sexual harassment by male supervisors, the rationing that they themselves imposed on, on themselves regarding how much water they drank so they wouldn't need to use the bathroom as often, uh, the extra unpaid hours they put into the assembly line so they could simply meet production quotas of t-shirts, jeans, and shirts that would be consumed uh, in uh, various stores around the world. And they also spoke of the long and exhausting trips on crowded buses from home to the factory and back home again to cook, clean, and care for their children. So under these conditions then, the surrogate mother explains, surrogacy seemed easy. All they needed to do was get pregnant, live in dormitories with other women where they formed deep friendships and build the sorts of networks they knew they needed in order to glean opportunities in their precarious urban lives. While I described surrogacy as a global reproductive assembly line, traversing households in US suburbs, over perhaps purchased from South African white women, or sperm uh, purchased from Denmark, all assembled into new life in a third world woman's body. The surrogate mothers themselves saw something else. It wasn't as if they didn't recognize their exploitation but it was interesting in terms of how they cast their labor, right? They perceived that their labor uh, generated social and economic value. As Indirani, one of the surrogate mothers who I got quite close to pointed out to me, she said to me, you know, very matter of fact, Sharmila, she said, I make you a t-shirt, you wear it, and you don't think twice before you throw it away, but I make you a baby. I change your life, right? So at some level, um, Melinda Cooper and Catherine Waldby, uh, Australian uh, feminist scholars, describe surrogacy as a form of clinical labor, wherein the abstract temporal imperatives of accumulation are put to work at the level of the body. Though gestation is not recognized as labor per se, because pregnant women do not perform codified quantifiable tasks. Surrogate mothers offer themselves up to subjects, giving clinics and clinicians access to their productivity of their in vivo biology, the biological labor of living tissues and reproductive processes. Surrogate mo uh, mothers are workers in a Marxian sense because in vivo processes of eugenesis and gestation are used to create surplus value. Working with surrogate mothers, I came to realize there are no easy divisions to be drawn between productive and reproductive labor, reproductive assembly lines and care work, tending to the intimate needs of upper middle class family uh, making, parental desires, and the burning yearnings for genetically descended children, right? My second point that I wanted to make in the presentation my work on surrogacy has led me to engage more deeply with the literature on reproductive justice, which moves beyond simple discussions of abortion access or birth control. Uh, reproductive justice, uh, Loretta Ross notes, is the work toward recognizing that our reproductive and sexual health and our ability to live healthy lives 
depends on the re realization of the social, economic, and political empowerment of ourselves, our families, and our communities. Central to reproductive justice understandings then are ideals of environmental degradation and food sovereignty, for example. Conceptions of care as concrete work of maintenance with ethical and affective implications then move away from focusing on just social worlds to pull in forms of caring for non-human beings, right? So I end my presentation with just a few questions for all of us. What does it mean to break up work into productive, reproductive, social reproduction, or market reproduction, market reproduction, uh, if you will, or market production, if you will? What might it mean to expand care work to include the affective, ethical, and physical tasks in involved in gardening, uh, taking care of dogs and cats that animate our lives, or tending to the streams and creeks that crisscross our towns, cities, and backyards. And finally, might these kinds of queries that we have, thinking about human and non-human bodies and the kinds of care and a caring ethics uh, orient us towards a politics uh, beyond work. So those were my comments for today. I guess it's Sneha and Carrie. Yeah, I can go. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this conversation uh, as well. And you know, so, so I'll start um, you know, thinking about this current moment, right? Uh, more than a year into the pandemic that uh, you know, in, in many ways has made it more uh, difficult for you know, already uh, undervalued care work and, and, and workers. Uh, both paid and unpaid, um, and in in other ways, and trying to think through this, uh, you know, has maybe created or um, is uh, allowing for the emergence of opportunities for reimagining care work um, at a at a community and collective level. Um, so I'm I'm a healthcare worker, an internist, a hospitalist. Um, I work in the hospital. Um, and for the better part of part of the the, the past 15 months, um, I've been helping care for patients that are admitted to the hospital with severe COVID, uh, severe COVID-19. And you know, some weeks have been absolutely horrendous, uh, with several patients, uh, several uh, you know uh, patients dying uh, within within a week without family present, um, really in the presence of very isolated. Healthcare workers, whether nurses or respiratory therapists, medical assistants, um, custodians, custodial staff, uh, physicians. Um, inside the hospital, in some ways, there's been an increase in collective spirit amongst uh, frontline uh, healthcare workers, um, I would argue. If only in the sense that uh, you know the, the 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 sort of work over this past year has uh, you know there's been this collective trauma you know certainly in in general but 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 uh, acutely felt within the hospital. However, you know traditional hierarchical divisions, differential occupational risk and hazard, uh, pay, uh, differential protections, all really continue to prevent true solidarity and possibilities of organizing across healthcare workers. So, you know, something that I'm thinking thinking through is in the space of healthcare work, where are the possibilities of building collective healthcare work? Right? Where are those where are those possibilities? Um, I'm also an organizer and activist, and you know, working in Austin with Communities of Color United for Racial Justice. So, one of the things that I'm uh, thinking through is how is community organizing, advocacy, and activism. Uh, how can that be framed as collective um, or community care work? So, you know, healthcare workers across the U.S., uh, specifically lower wage healthcare workers um, who are disproportionately black and brown, uh, disproportionately women, have been, you know, understaffed, underpaid, underprotected, you know, long before COVID. And, you know, as COVID's ravaged through the United States and, and you know, the world, um, in healthcare, there's really been little 
uh, pressure from federal or state workplace regulators to improve safety at the at the worker level. Um, and you know this is particularly true for lower wage, non hospital based care workers, including home health care workers, nursing home workers, um, perpetuating racial disparities of workplace transmission and of community spread in areas where uh, frontline essential workers live. You know, we've heard over the course of this past year uh, countless stories of nurses, aides, care workers without access to adequate personal protective equipment, paid sick leave, job security, um, other basic worker protections. We've also we've also seen that in places where healthcare workers organized, um, and in particular where healthcare workers are organized in 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 their unions uh, to fight for for safe conditions and protections on the job. On their jobs, they've they've had better outcomes. For example, in New York, um, long-term care facilities where workers were organized saw significantly lower COVID uh, mortality rates. You know, about 30% lower than in non-union facilities. So, you know, for some frontline healthcare workers, I think working conditions over this past year have changed some of the conversation around organizing. Um, we're seeing a slight uptick in new membership with. Uh, National Nurses United and with the National Union of Healthcare Workers. So, you know, where I see some possibility um, for organizing amongst healthcare workers um, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of, uh, you know, this ongoing moment of racial reckoning, in the midst of, uh, you know, health inequities being sort of made crystal clear, um, healthcare workers. So re-asking this question, you know, who do who do we serve and who do we protect? Who do we work for and, and why? Um, you know, do we work, do we serve at the behest of our employers, you know, mostly private healthcare companies functioning within a for-profit system? Or is there an opportunity, can we reimagine sort of new possibilities of, of care and public safety that emerge from a, a, a greater public health lens? Can we as healthcare workers build collective action to serve and protect, protect the communities that we care for uh, by working towards building new systems of, of community care. You know, we've, we've seen the effects of uh, long-term underinvestment, undervaluing of public health um, and public health workers. Um, and, you know, despite uh, witnessing this, you know, during this current moment, much of public health and medical messaging remains in a very narrow lane of personal health and responsibility and in, in preventing, uh, you know, and treating, in tr you know, treating disease and illness, right? Like uh, Libby, as you, as you talked about. So, you know, one question I have is how do we as healthcare workers support a more ambitious agenda of public health, right? That's rooted in frameworks of social medicine, that's rooted in frameworks of structural uh, analysis and structural determinants of health place that I see some hope around this, and this comes from a long history um, in the Global South and a, a more recent history um, in the United States, is in the building of, uh, of, of cadres of community health workers, right? frontline public health workers who are from and have close relationships with the communities that they serve in order to support individual and community level health care. Um, and I think a core component of the work of community health workers is as community organizers, right, as capacity builders and advocates who promote community action and collective empowerment. And, you know, in this way, there may be an opportunity for other health workers, other healthcare workers across the spectrum of healthcare to align with community health workers to build new systems of community care, as well as possibly uh, to build new alliances in the organization of healthcare workers, right? Going back to sort of thinking about, uh, you know, expanding our notions of what is care and what is work, can we think of community organizing and advocacy as care work, right? In particular, so reflecting on this past year, the work of activists and organizers you know, part of a, a, a long tradition, a long history of organizing uh, for racial justice, social, economic, environmental justice, abolition. How do we think of this work as collective care work? That is the work of organizers and activists as work that we do in the care of and uh, to, to care for our communities. 
uh, here in Austin and you know, really across the country, um, in many places, organizers and activists and community members, especially black and brown women, are demanding that cities reallocate their budgets to support you know, uh, public safety and public health goals, right? to reallocate city public police funds to public health, to housing, to child care and, and broader community care and safety efforts. And much of this work is fueled by community members and advocates performing unpaid work to improve community care. In addition, uh, in addition to community care that organizers, advocates, and activists are pushing forward through, through demanding budgetary and policy change, they're asking the questions, you know, asking the question, how, how, how do we mobilize our people and our communities to care for each other in the face of this perpetual myth of individual independence, right, um, as, as Mia Mingus put it. So we're seeing growing mutual aid networks um, in, you know, which folks are directly supporting each other with material survival needs, food, water, shelter, child care, medical care, at a time when formal state-based systems continue to fail to sufficiently provide these resources to those that are made most vulnerable. And these mutual aid networks also support the building of social movements and, and, and organizing work, right? Creating collective childcare spaces allows for collective work of organizers and activists to take place. Providing resource support through mutual aid brings individuals and communities together to, to, to build power to shift policy priorities. So in expanding this discussion on you know, what is care and what is work, I'm thinking about how community organizing, how community health work, and mutual aid are, are forms of collective care work. And I'll pause there and pass over to Carrie. Hi, yeah, thanks y'all. Um, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this really great panel. And I appreciate us. We met uh, yesterday as um, Shamila mentioned to talk about like how we were thinking about these questions of care and work and care work. And it's really excited to actually practice some of the things that we're talking about through those conversations, right? Um, so thanks for being here today. Um, I'll start with just thinking about this current moment um, as COVID-19 uh, I think represents the, for many of us the culmination of multiple ongoing crises of racial capitalism. Um, and when we look for it, and I'm, you know, when we look for it, racism is visible in historical and ongoing ways, enabling capitalist land distribution, dispossession, exploitation, and plantation agriculture. And this is how I try to conceptualize racial capitalism in my own work. Um, I use this framework to understand the how, why, and where of industrial agriculture and food work. Um, so last spring, people really began thinking very critically and carefully about meat, um, where we get it, who produces it, and to what effects. And this, this sudden attention sort of happened for a number of reasons, right? There are, we were bombarded with images of, of chickens and pigs that were ready to be euthanized by the millions across the country and the world. Um, fast food chains began running out of of hamburgers and grocery store prices of, of pork loins were skyrocketing. And um, the National Meat Institute, um, NAMI, and yes, we have a National Meat Institute, uh, mobilized against the, the calls and warnings of public health officials, of worker advocacy groups, um, and a larger concerned public to keep meat processing and poultry processing plants running. They even worked with the previous administration to pass the Defense Production Act, right, um, to enforce those plants to keep running. Um, and so this is one way that I think about um, the current crisis and how many of us are thinking about meat and meat work and um, the people who produce meat in our country. But another way of understanding this is to think about um, what I, I call like more quiet, intimate um, ways. Um, through the obituaries of some of the first workers in poultry processing to pass um, because of the side effect, their complications from COVID-19. Um, and three of those workers, um, Ms. Ellis Willis, who is 56, Ms. Mary Holt, who's 56, and Ms. Annie Grant, who's 55, um, all worked in the Tyson Food Plant in Camilla, Georgia. Um, and these were all black women, union members, mothers, daughters, aunties, 
um, all working collectively in this plant for 77 years. Um, so I, I think about these two things together because not just to, to recall a story of despair, right, of trauma, um, but to think about um, these people as more than just exploited workers under racial capitalism and think about their four lives. And in many ways, as Sharmila uh, sort of pushed us in the beginning to think beyond the concept of labor, a category of labor. So um, I, I hold these stories within the same frame to think about the long history and labor of women and mostly black women in feeding our love or addiction um, depending how we look at it, uh, to processed chicken, to cheap processed chicken. Um, and I believe that this examination helps us understand racial capitalism through the lens of food, but also ways of being and living otherwise that persist in spite of the system's dominance. Um, and in this moment, I also wonder about the quiet separation and, and dominant discourse of COVID-19 and the uprisings in defense of Black lives. Um, and appreciate all the people, many on this panel and, and in this larger pop-up institute who are thinking about these things as um, historically and geographically relational. Uh, another piece of my work is connecting prisons to the poultry industry, as these are two sites of what geographers think of as organized abandonment, so purposely abandoned peoples and places as site of, uh, sites of racial capitalist accumulation. Um, so I, in this work, I wanted to understand hot spots, right, as, as they popped up um, relationally in both um, animal processing plants uh, and their broader communities, right, because the um, COVID-19 was not constrained to those places, um, but also um, prisons across the country, right, um, and this comes through research or field work with um, workers and their families and broader communities in Northeast Georgia, but also to movements around prison abolition. Um, and so across prisons and poultry plants, I think racial capitalism structures whose lives are valuable and whose lives are not, but also what places matter and what places through, um, do not through the organization of space and time. And a structural way of understanding life and death that helps us understand not only um, life and death, but connectivity across movements. So what are the openings as Snehal is like pushing us to think about? across sort of unexpected sites? Um, what are the relationalities that we might see emerging um, in moments of crisis, right? Um, this is the exciting word to me. Um, I think, you know, responding to this, this question on care, I think of this in two ways. Um, first in food work. So poultry processing um, work is fundamentally food work, right? Which is, and we all need to, eat to live. This is kind of what brought me to this work in the first place. Um, and I'll just start by quoting um, Kiese Lehman, who writes, often writes about um, his grandmother who worked in a poultry plant in Mississippi for decades, right? And he says, um, there's layers to this. And he's quoting her. Grandma often said when describing her job to folks, she went to that plant every day knowing it was a laboratory for racial and gendered terror. That's the end of that quote, right? And so I think about this quote, it's, it's, it's sat with me for so long and it's so straightforward and simple, but I think it helps us peel back the layers, right? Um, to understand the conditions that shape this very essential, right? Food work in our, for our country. Um, so I think this helps us also think about Sharmila's point to get beyond just narrow conceptions of labor and workers as paid work, right? And, and those people are the, as the ones who matter in labor organizing and our sudden shift and focus on essential workers, right? Um, and it's not to abandon labor specific organizing. And by that, I mean, organizing around and for better conditions of paid work. But I do want to think and do um, with what Tyree Scott and Cindy Domingo, who are two labor organizers up here in the Pacific Northwest, um, what they call working class geniuses, right? Past and present. So what does it mean if we take Jimmy Boggs's words, thinking and doing, and Jimmy Boggs was an, a, an auto worker in Detroit, Michigan, originally from Marion Junction, Alabama. Um, when he studied, he studied the decimation of the auto industry there in Detroit. 
um, what it did to all workers and communities, but specifically or especially to black workers in their communities. Um, and he came to this very simple conclusion by saying, you know, the job ain't the answer. A job ain't the answer, right? Um, so what happens when we see the 50 black workers who walked off the line in Kathleen, Georgia, um, when they said enough is enough at the poultry plant back in April 2020, um, not only as workers, but as people with whole lives, families, experiences, ideas, feelings that are shaped and constrained by so much more than their work at the chicken plant. What happens when we think holistically about the conditions that produce shitty jobs in the first place for people and places produced through and abandoned by capital? Um, instead of more shitty jobs to feed America, might labor movements and unions create the conditions for their own demise? Um, to follow the lead of Black Southerners in Jackson and beyond calling for cooperative and community controlled work and social, broader social systems? Um, might we think also about the long struggle for abolition? That's the one rooted in the great experiment, and that's Du Bois's words, right, of Black Reconstruction and persisting um, in radical abolitionist organizing that simultaneously tears down while building alternatives in its place. Um, and I have some more things to say about organizing and, and responding to some of Sneha's really, really provocative questions, but I'll pause there and, and let us have more of a discussion if y'all want. Um, thank you all so much. Those are those are incredible presentations. And um, to be honest, I'm not sure what role I can play as a moderator, other than kind of opening up the space. But um, I thought I could kind of reiterate some of those questions so we could all hear them um, and just uh, kind of frame them a little bit. So um, in Libby's work, in Libby's presentation, we heard about um, and we saw the ways that um, work understood right as production, work sites, and care that work with social reproduction are actually quite um, interwoven, um, both in the case of the aluminum smelting plant work that uh, Libby and I have done, um, as well as in the ways that that connection, that division is, has been reiterated in the kind of quote unquote solutions or understandings of the pandemic, and the failure to address um, work as, as known as it is that, um, Occupational exposure has been, you know, a vital has been really the site of um, transmission around COVID nineteen, um, and and then the turn again to individual biology and behaviors in treatment. Um, in Sharmila's presentation, um, she closed by asking, "What does it mean to break work um, to not have to not break work up into these, uh, you know, artificial spheres of production, social re social reproduction, uh, biological reproduction?" Um, and what would it mean to take seriously the affective, ethical, and physical tasks that are involved in maintaining homes, families, and our ecological, broadly speaking, relations, not only with humans? What would it mean to take that work seriously and to consider that work as reproductive justice, that it's not, reproductive justice isn't either only about the individual um, body or the capacity to have or access uh, care for children, but really about that work of um, maintaining life that happens um, and all that all humans, as you said, Sharmila, you know, really need and also provide care, um, which I really love that reframing that that is actually, it's universal in a certain sense that it's actually, even though labor tends to, uh, you know, structurally be divided in racial and gendered terms that the fundamental need and ability to provide care is actually a universal um, and that might make some shift possible for us to understand that um, universal, universality of care. Um, Snehal had closed uh, with thinking about the this kind of moment of reckoning where so many of the structural divisions are being reiterated um, but also these uh, identifying these moments of possibilities um, including, for example, that organized healthcare workers, um, spaces of organization actually led to improved outcomes, um, the kind of growth of uh, solidarity spirit among hospital workers, and this rising tide around um, community health work, which is both, uh, from my understanding and from our conversations, you know, seeking to be co-opted back into maintaining the healthcare system as it is, even as it 
uh, creates the possibility for seeing um, care otherwise. Um, and Sehla talked about, you know, building coalitions with community organizers. And I love that reframing that, you know, thinking about that work of organizing and building collective power and space as care work, that that is work that both requires care and makes possible other formations of care, and that it is care work in itself. Um, yeah, and we're seeing that, um, you know, I think that has been, for so many of us who care about these questions, that has been, um, it's been so inspiring actually to see the, the rise of mutual aid networks, to see the amazing and widespread collective organizing that's happened, particularly in relation to abolition and really at quite large scales, if you think about, you know, um, communities that are disenfranchised and people doing unpaid work all this time during the pandemic to transform and push back on city policy, for example. Um, so that, yeah, lot, lots to think about there, I think, in terms of possibilities. And Carrie, um, Carrie, I really loved how you talked about the openings we can see across unexpected sites, and these kinds of relationalities emerging in moments of crises. Um, and the, you know, that image you left us with of the workers walking off the plant and how their demands were not only about work, right? Jimmy Boggs, the job ain't the answer. Um, and I saw that also, as you know, I've seen that in my work as well with aluminum workers, this kind of, um, exchange that is made for wages that often workers both know the exchange they made, know what they're walking into, and even knowing that, that that's not the answer, that their lives, you know, are so much more than that. And seeing um, their organizing as a kind of imagination of something else that is possible, that, um, that they're calling on all of us really to do that work of reimagining. So what happens, Carrie asked, when we think holistically about the conditions producing shitty jobs in the first place, can labor unions create the conditions for their own demise? I really love that question, um, that even the quote unquote solutions, right, of organizing that we uh, turn to often as answers, um, you know, thinking of workers only as workers, that, that even those um, quote unquote solutions, right, structural solutions require reimagination um, in order to think past these divisions, that workers' lives are not only at the plant, um, which, you know, has been a consideration of feminists for such a long time, and that taking the social reproduction work, taking that work of maintaining life seriously, means thinking of that work of uh, creating healthy communities, environments, is the work of abolition. That, that is the work that we all need to do. And I wanted to, just to close out my comments, um, draw attention to um, this uh, review paper that uh, came out recently, written by also a faculty at UT, um, Hiile Hobart, um, along with Tamara Nice. I can drop, I'll drop the citation in the chat in a second. Um, but they write about um, radical care um, and uh, it's a special issue and their intro to it is a really wonderful, summary in some ways of um, these questions around radical care uh, and survival strategies uh, for uncertain times is how they frame it. And uh, the rest of the issue really gets into each paper talks, you know, to some extent about um, these questions around the affective ethical considerations, but also about actual strategies, right, that people are coming up with to enact, um, to make possible radical care. And we might think of radical care from that paper as mobilizations of care that allow us to envision what Elizabeth Pavanelli describes as an otherwise. And I really love that, that the, in, in building these other forms of care, we are imagining and acting in otherwise, uh, making a future, other futures possible. And in particular, they identify, you know, these kind of, we, when we say care in the general public, we often think of self-care, which is so popular. And also in this time, the right has become really um, a mantra for a lot of people. Um, feminist self-care, but even feminist self-care, when we think about in these contexts about care workers, right? What does it mean to care for ourselves, for people who are doing that work? What does it mean for abolition organizers to have to also figure out ways for themselves, their families um, and their communities to survive in these uncertain times when they've been abandoned by the state? Um, and so thinking about both self-care, but also 
um, the work of activist care, uh, particularly that has been driven in this country often by black and brown women um, who are continuing to provide the forms of care that the state doesn't provide, right? And again, with COVID, we've seen that over and over. Um, so I'll just uh, drop that in the chat and um, I'll open it up to you all to have a conversation across um, your presentations. Um, I also see some hands, but let me give the panelists a few minutes, maybe five, 10 minutes, and then we can, um, unless you want to go to Q&A right away, but um, I'd love to see what you have to say to each other. I'm wondering if we can actually just open it for Q&A and then use this Q&As to weave our conversations together, if that's okay. Sure, sure of course, okay? let's do that. Um, so I see Philip Bears' hand and there's a question in the chat. So why don't I go to the chat question first from Anne Lewis. I question the division and says between community organizing and labor organizing, when mine workers organized, they not only changed wages and working conditions, but also busted the coal company towns, policing, and created a progressive community healthcare system. More recently, I documented a successful poultry plant organizing effort, um, pro-union 400 plus to 18 against undocumented and Latina that would not have been possible without intensive community organizing. So I think that's been uh, kind of just thrown out generally. So if anyone would like to pick that up, the division between community organizing and labor organizing and that workers often have also organized for, for their communities, right? Community conditions. I can, I can, um, yeah, and I, I thank you for that comment. Um, so yeah, my goal definitely not to, to draw a line between uh, labor and community, and I agree with you. I, I've seen it historically um, with radical labor organizing being very rooted in the community. Um, you could think of it in terms of community unionism or um, like you just community organizing, right, with um, uh, movements across the country. I think about the South and uh, the Black Communists, Alabama. Uh, this is Robin Kelly's amazing work, right? What was possible because of those links of labor and community? And, and so I agree with you 100%. I also think, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to draw lines between, but I think there are also sometimes <laughs> within labor organizing a very narrowed and focused um, attention to the paid um, side of production right uh, and in the south I think there are particular challenges which you've seen in Tennessee with your your work right um, uh, because of the real lack of, of support and funding, but uh, for a lot of the unions to actually do good work, community organized and rooted in the community kind of organizing work um, across parts of the South. I saw it in, in the poultry plants that I was working in. You know, one, one was organized by UFCW and successfully um, right at the uh, 2013, and they were successful on the backs of all this anti-immigration legislation um, and they were, while there were, there were real efforts um, to, to build across undocumented workers and uh, quote unquote native born black workers mostly, um, those efforts were pretty, uh, um, they were pretty much decimated through um, anti-immigrant le legislations across the state and then the plants themselves sort of following up and accepting that legislation, right? And so I'm thinking, not trying to disparage the kinds of organizing that was happening there, I think it was really important and exciting, but also thinking about the immense structures <laughs> that are making the beautiful community organizing that you're talking about um, nearly impossible, right? So I, I would love to hear more about like your Film and and I think that's something that we could we could discuss too the kinds of community organizing that you were seeing, um, and also here in upstate New York, you know I think we um, I was on a panel recently with some organizers out in um, Eastern Washington, and they're talking about you know their their lack of um, entry into the in, or like uh, support through the NLRB and through those sort of formal channels or actually open the doors for different kinds of labor organizing outside of, of the big unions that they find really, really powerful. 
Um, so they're able to organize um, families, right? And they wanted to frame their organizing around families and not around workers as this like um, productive you know, only the people who are working um, in the processing plants, but also thinking about broader community needs like you're talking about. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that comment. And um, did you want to respond or speak? Sure, but I don't, I think there are all kinds of other components of this conversation that are really important. Um, I just want to say that I think there's a real stereotype of what labor organizing is. First of all, we close our eyes and we see a white male factory worker every time we think of a labor organizing. And in fact, it's predominantly women and very heavily women of color. I, I mean, I think that we have a very strange un understanding of this. And um, and I love, I love the reference to Hammer and Ho and, um, and this notion that we're all in this together and, and thinking of workers as full people with agency. Um, I think also that nearly every single victorious or effort at labor organizing has um, included an uprising of a people, whether that's regional or based on, on race, um, or ethnicity, it's, it's part and parcel of the ability to win over a corporate structure. So I think it's terribly important to include um, those possibilities of workplace change. Um, and the, the issues tend to be around health. Uh, that's the other thing that I think we don't realize occupational health and the mine workers and their rank and file uprising around black lung disease um, uh, and um, you know in the chicken plant one of the major issues was water splashing into eyes and causing eye infections that's the kind of stuff that workers organize about as much as wages and benefits and that kind of stuff so uh, I, I think for care work this, these kinds of, of, of uprisings among workers, which is probably a better way to look at it, um, are, are incredibly important still. Yeah. And uh, Nina Ebner in the chat also wanted to point out that um, it's in interesting to think about how demands by workers, even at the so-called point of production are often reproductive, whether explicit or implicit. Um, with the example of uh, Macladores in Ciudad Juarez during the pandemic, where there were wildcat labor stoppages where people demanded to be sent home with full wages and made demands like we want to live. Thank you for that. Um, let me uh, turn to, I think I saw, was it Philip? Can I ask you to? Yeah, thank you. Um, really, really rich and powerful presentations and discussions. I have to apologize because I have to hop off exactly at two. So I might be able to just ask my question and, and hear a few words. Um, and it's sort of an idiosyncratic question. I was just wondering if anyone had any thoughts about. I Yesterday, I heard two juxtaposed radio interviews and I've been kind of disturbed by them ever since. And one, it, it, the issue was a nurse I think it's a hospital chain in Connecticut with 26,000 employees, but I forget the name of the chain, who has organized some of her um, co-workers, but not only nurses, other hospital workers, in a lawsuit, <clears throat> excuse me, against the hospital's mandate that all uh, hospital work, care workers have to get vaccinated in order to keep their jobs. And so they interviewed her. And then they interviewed the CEO. And instinctively, I was, you know, my sympathies were not with the CEO. Um, he was very kind of like smarmy and um, condescending and um, all the things that CEOs often are. On the other hand, um, the person who had worked, the nurse who had organized this class action suit, and I, I guess she's working with an attorney, um, was just, you know, saying stuff that from everything I know is complete misinformation about the vaccines 
And I, I did think that the CEO was using the language of care. And it did feel like he made a good point that, you know, in order to care for our patients, we need our workers to care for themselves and we need them to do it by getting these vaccines. And then he added, and anyone who doesn't is basically given two weeks notice and fired. And so I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts about that kind of that situation. I mean, I think the, the issue of vaccines and, and mask wearing and all that has given a different spin to some of these questions about um, corporate or government um, imposition specifically of, of different forms of biopower over workers and others. Um, and I say that mostly because I, you know, I kind of tend towards thinking people should have been forced to wear masks, should have been forced to. I mean, I, I confess, confess that. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. I'm wondering if, you know, this can also be just a conversation of this, not amongst the panelists, but we open it up to everyone, right? And have it more of a conversation. Uh, You know, I, I just think it's completely an example of the, of the horror of individualization of an epidemic. I, I just, it it's represents what's wrong with racialized capitalism in a profound way. That people think of themselves as individuals rather than thinking of themselves as part of the institution that, that they serve and that they need to protect and part of and parcel. I mean, it's, it's alienation at its most basic. That's my sense of this. Yeah, I, I agree with that and also, um, you know, see the, um, you know, collective uh, will of whatever group of care workers to determine Sort of, you know, the, the, what what you know, goes into their body, right? Um, and and so, you know, I, I agree. I think I think the the way that um, uh, you know policies during this pandemic, certainly, but but you know, uh, public health related policies um, transpire in a very individualistic, very sort of personal health approach to how we're going to. Um, you know, decrease risk and improve public health um, is, 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 you know, is the problem, right? So, so, you know, mandating, mandating individual masking um, is necessary and insufficient um, in many, in many ways, right? It's not, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of, you know, a very narrow way of, of, of thinking about public health. And at the same time, I think, um, Collectives of workers, you know, whether that's in the the healthcare space or in in other spaces, I think, you know, uh, part of the uh, part of the process of, of of you know building and maintaining autonomy uh, within within the, the the space of 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 workers is to be able to have to be able to have, have, have say in that. And so I, you know, I, I mean, I think, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating one way or one way or other here. Um, but I, but I think there's a tension, uh, certainly. And, and that tension exists between public health and, um, you know, whatever other collectives, um, you know, might exist. Right. And so, and so, you know, that has to be a, there has to be a process of mediation there too. Um, I thought I would also um, offer a little bit of perspective from uh, coming off of a year of naively going to work for the state government, thinking it would um, be here to protect the people. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I've been thinking a lot in this past year about um, what my my former mentor Steve Wing 
who unfortunately passed away a few years ago would be saying in this situation. And I, I think, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to um, work on the sort of worker health team who never once made an effort to talk to workers themselves, but only were talking to the employers. Um, and as soon as the vaccine became available, that became the only focus. And, you know, everyone was sort of shocked when workers at the poultry processing and the meat processing facilities were not interested in receiving the vaccine from their employer after, you know, not being given paid sick leave, not being, um, you know, being disincentivized from getting tested, any protections in place beforehand. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's all I have on that, Carrie. Yeah, I think there's a similar um, tension here in, in Washington state with inside the prisons. I mean, DOC was vac trying to vaccinate people. Um, and we, um, I'm part of Free the Mall, which is an abolitionist um, group here, grassroots. And uh, uh, we were contacted by the King County Department of Health to try to like understand the situation from all the folks and loved ones that we have inside and their response and trepidation and fear of taking the vaccine, right? And I agree with Philip. On the one hand, we think, you know, I took the vaccines and I'm excited to have the vaccines and to be with family and loved ones inside, but I also understand the distrust, extreme distrust of the federal government, of the Department of Corrections, of the people administering the vaccines and the lack of communication or transparency on that process, right, for folks inside. And so um, our recommendation was to work with some of the, um, there are several um, black led public health initiatives happening here in, in the region um, and there are public community vaccination clinics that are happening that are rooted within the community, right? And that's a very different approach to this conversation um, than the, <laughs> the approach that DOC had. It's a great question though. Thank you, Philip. Um, I see Sonia, Sonia's hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I had a question about the use of the term racial capitalism. And I was wondering if you could, um, if you could speak a little bit to the use of that term in a more global context. And I think that the way in which um, COVID-19 has been addressed across the world has been so uh, distinct um, that I just worry about the use of terms that are coined in one society, one country, um, and the ways in which we're looking at um, other countries and how um, these various countries are handling uh, uh, something like a global pandemic. I was wondering, I know that you focused very much on the US and I was just wondering if you've had a chance to consider this within the global context. I also wanted to thank um, all of you for these really um, informative and engaging conversations. And also I'm curious um, um, in terms of Sharmila's work and the transnational perspective that you brought. Um, the idea, uh, I, I was really struck by the comment that the lady with whom you worked um, uh, uh, essentially spoke about um, you know, a t-shirt versus a making a child as something that one remembers and how that's contextualized within a, also a society in which, um, or a country in which there are children in need who um, could be adopted, but for political reasons cannot be adopted internationally by non-Indian um, uh, or uh, individual that are the individuals that are not connected to India, um, you know how that justification as an individual is ingrained is in us to say, well, um, it, it's not a T-shirt; it is this reproduction, and therefore there will be, you know, the remembering and the and the, and the just the the awareness uh, that's justified by the fact that. Uh, they're also working within the constraints of a society in which um, 
one has to question um, reproduction in general. So I was just curious about both topics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia, those, for those questions. You know, and at some level, I see those as related, the question of racial capitalism and the ways by which, uh, you know, uh, especially third world, you know, calling them third world, these, these surrogate mothers who are engaging in uh, surrogacy, right? where we valorize their reproduction for market purposes. But for the longest history, India has had some of the most virulent forms of population control. So the very women that I worked with who were surrogate mothers had all been sterilized. They'd all had the tubes tied, right? So they're at some level, you know, caught up in these networks of the ways by which populations are being managed and the ways by which the bodies are being manipulated and I'd really like to think through this conversation through the lens of racial capitalism. If you were to think about it in a global sense, when you think about uh, the ways by which even India is understood to have a population problem, where those emerges from, that emerges from, right? These long histories of imperialism, famine in India, mass death. Um, I mean, some of the work that I've been doing is even thinking about how it is that India is starting to be seen as having a population problem, right? Uh, the famines of the uh, early 20th century, the late 1900s, millions of people are dying on the street, right? And that is under colonialism, what Mike Davis calls, um, I guess, uh, the late Victorian holocausts, right? Uh, of 1800s, late 1800s. That doesn't get necessarily seen as a problem of distribution, but it starts getting seen as a problem of Indian overreproduction of people, right? And so it's not the ways by which food gets distributed and what's being grown uh, and where that food is directed, as Mike Davis beautifully says, right? While Indians are starving, Londoners are eating Indian bread, right? Um, so it's, it's, and I think there's ways by which we can think about this kind of racialized capitalism is never at some level an abstract form of, a, of accumulation, right, uh, or surplus extraction. Questions of race and gender are implicitly and intricately tied into ways by which capital is organized and produces um, wealth, I would imagine. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm wondering whether at some level that uh, Sonia addresses some of these issues and thinking about you know, assisting production, uh, reproduction, desisting reproduction, and it's all happening in the same body. And who is this woman's body going to be used for is the question that, that comes up. And it's not surprising at some level that women themselves look at the kinds of evisceration of life that is happening in these garment factories where all of us are wearing t-shirts from Gap and such, right? Um, <laughs> right, uh, the, the fast fashion and the, um, and the disposability and women see their lives as being disposed within that, right? And to say that, you know, to think about how there's a kind of valorization of reproductive labor and the ways by which they connect to that and see that as value, right? Um, it's, it's not at some level, I guess, surprising at all. Um, I mean, I could say so much about vaccine diplomacy and what's going on, but I think Carrie's had her hand up. And I'm going to stop there. Can I also, Carrie, are you addressing this question? Or are you shifting gears? No, I just don't know technology. Sorry. I, <laughs> okay. okay. I wanted to jump into around that question. I think it's an important one about the term racial capitalism. Um, I'm actually working on a special issue right now that's thinking about difference in India, broadly speaking, right across caste, religion, uh, indigeneity, tribes, um, and why thinking about them in terms of racialization is important. Um, and one point, you know, to think about already, right? Any, we think of uh, race as emerging generally in the transatlantic kind of context, right? And the Americas. But if you think about kind of global capitalism, um, it is like truly global in scope. And so there's a way in which different regions are interpolated into that. So that's one uh, point I wanted to make, right? That when we think about, um, who are care workers in the US, which is kind of the point of we were making in our um, article on COVID-19, uh, workforces are racialized, including you know, which uh, immigrant populations 
serve in hospices, for example, or work in meat industries, even if you think about, you know, the industries in the US that have been most vulnerable, like here in Austin construction, agri agricultural labor, these were historically, um, right, industries that were black workers, and then um, particularly in relation uh, or in response to organizing, right, were uh, shifted to immigrant workforces. So there is something already, right, about racial capitalism that is about uh, flows, right, about flows of workers across uh, regions and across, including those contexts that we don't think of as um, in terms of race in the same way. And the other point I wanted to make is if you think about um, how COVID has played out, for example, in India, there is a very racial dimension to it about who has been um, similar to here. And, and again, I'm saying this, saying that in India, it's not thought of in terms of race and isn't spoken about that way. But if you look at who has been um, made increasingly vulnerable, precarious, for example, migrant workers within India, I'm talking about workforces, right, uh, migrating within, it, even within the context of the state, that it has predominantly been, for example, uh, Muslim folks, poor Muslim communities that have been um, more vulnerable because of their uh, lack of structural protection, um, you know, outright violence um, in, in, during COVID times, as well as migrant workers, for example, from the Northeast who have migrated to urban centers and were, you know, basically told um, when the pandemic initially broke out there that they have to return home. I mean, you're talking about complete, I mean, return home on by foot on trains on, you know, absolutely no protection. I'm not even talking about workplace protection, but, you know, fundamentally precarious. So there is a kind of racial dimension in that oh, sense. Can I, can I also yeah. add? So yeah, Dalit. please jump in. It's, it's yes. also Dalit and Dalit. as well. Mm -hmm. So we can actually also include Dalits into the question. And, and at some level, what has also been happening is, you know, this is something that I've been working with a graduate student of mine, is, you know, in India, we've been seeing images of cremation grounds. Uh, and the lack of space, uh, forget hospital beds, right? Uh, there's been a huge lack of cremation grounds for Hindus specifically to cremate their loved ones. But along with that, um, what we're also not seeing, but is hugely prevalent is burial grounds for Muslims. Uh, burial grounds are already such a fraught, um, fraught political question in urban India, as there's all these land pressures and the uh, Hindu right-wing government does not sanction land uh, to, you know, to various Muslim communities, religious organizations with burial. So burial grounds for Muslims have become incredibly fraught and politicized that even in debt, right? Uh, <laughs> you see the ways by which, if you want to call it racial capitalism, playing out. Uh, and the other thing that we've been seeing, seeing is a foster care and orphanage and orphan crisis. Uh, because unlike the famine, when you saw young, the youngest die, um, COVID has left uh, parents and grandparents dead. And there's a huge foster care, but also uh, orphanage crisis right now in India. Right. I'm sorry, Neville had his no, hand No, please. Thank you, Sharmila. Um, I had Nicole's hand up. Um, so I'm going to call Nicole and then Neville. You could call Neville first because I, I, I mine kind of goes in a different direction. So I'm, I'm suspecting that his is part of this vein. Okay, Neville, is it? <laughs> it is, it is okay. a response to the racial capitalism term question. I mean, and I, and I think I, I want to make two points. One is I think kind of theoretical terms move. Um, so just because racial capitalism and actually where and when it's invented is, is, a, is a complicated, at least by national story. But I'm just like, I think we, we can use it where it applies. I mean, I wouldn't say actually, we can only say the social contract when we're talking about France, because that's where Rousseau coined the term. So I think there, there's a, there's a, a, a terminological point about the cosmopolitanism of theory and the usefulness that it can't actually be contained in its uh, place of imagined national origin. And then if we think about racial capitalism, and I'm not, I'm not talking about what it refers to, I'm just talking about the genealogy of the term, it's actually used in South Africa to explain the South African situation. Oh, 
around about the same time, maybe a little bit before, before that Cedric Robinson coins it. And so I think it's not just an African-American term, and it's certainly not just an American term. Uh, and also, if we think about it, you know, Africa, African-America as a diasporic site, and actually the, the fact that there are so many Black people in the United States as a result of slavery, um, these, these, these histories that racial capitalism names are, are global, and in a way have always been global. And so I kind of think that that we need the cosmopolitanism of that term, and it actually and, I, and I've been loving these Indian examples examples because they show how racial capitalism works to differentiate amongst workers, even when the term race is buried under class or operates in the in the guise of other forms of embodied differentiation. Um, so I just I just want to make a strong case for the utility of the term of racial capitalism for describing situations well outside any national context. Thank you, Neville. And I have uh, dropped a few more uh, citations if they're helpful for folks of recent work that's been coming out, uh, collections mostly, and uh, and a solo article. Um, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Neville. Um, and thank you for this amazing, amazing panel. I really appreciate it hearing all of you. And you had me going in circles in my mind on all these different uh, ideas. And thank you, Pavi, too, for putting all that stuff in the chat. I love all the citations. My question is, is, is really about movement building and what's possible in this moment. Um, and where care fits into that um, and care work in the very diverse ways that you all have described it, um, where, where it fits. One of the people I had, I had an argument with uh, someone in my union not too long ago and she insisted that all, the only thing that the US, that we can do in the US, and I, I'm sorry to bring it to the US, but is contain the right. And so I guess I wanted to hear you all respond to that provocation from your various standpoints and to think about care work as part of movement building and, and to, yeah, I don't, I don't want to take the conversation too far afield of what you, where you started, but I think it's very relevant given how all of you positioned yourself in the conversation. Okay, can I quickly jump in? Thank you, Nicole, for that conversation. I mean, that question that pulls us all together in particular ways. And this is something we were grappling with yesterday. Um, you know, I keep sort of wondering about this. And I know this is sort of a strange thing to say in a panel or a, a pop-up on the future of work, but I had to bring it up, uh, right? Is there's so much value, uh, what shall I say, social, cultural, what shall I say, ideological value that is put on the idea of a worker, someone who's productive, someone who's not mooching off the system, right? Um, whereas we know that, you know, having at some level people unemployed is very central to the workings of modern societies, of modern economies. Uh, what might it actually look like if you decentered work and workers and thought about those who are not working, right? The so-called unproductive, right? What might it actually look like to pull away a focus from actually organizing on the issue of work? Um, I mean, it's just a provocation that happened. It's a really strange thing to be saying in terms of the future of work is to say, forget work and the worker, right? Because we valorize it so much. Um, we think about these as really the deserving people, right? Um, what might that look like? I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a question and a provocation that I have for all of us, I guess, especially in a pop-up that looks at the future of work. But thank you, Nicole, for that question. It, it raised that for me. Do any of the other panelists have thought about movement work, either about Nicole's very provocatory provocation about containing the right? Can I ask you, Nicole, to um, tell us, talk, share some of your thoughts about your question? 
I said, come on, I want to hear from you all. <laughs> I, I mean, the way I answered her at the time, I, I mean, I definitely think we have to do way more than that. And we are, right? I think that the point is to build across beyond the United States and across global lines. And if we don't do that, we are, we're doomed from the beginning because these forces are global. And so um, I definitely think we have to do more than that. I think we're doing more than that. And I think we have to really look beyond national territories and, and really mobilize beyond, beyond the, the normal ways that people talk about it. And I think there's lots of ways to connect. One of them is, is one of the ones that, you know what, why don't you all give me your ideas? Thank you. No, Nicole, you just said one of the ways. Tell us, tell us, Nicole, what do we need to do? I like it. I think we're all waiting patiently for you to speak, Nicole, actually. But <laughs> I will call in a panelist if that's not going to happen. I think I, I, I like that you asked this question, Nicole. Thank you. I mean, I think about this in, in up here in Washington and down with folks in Mississippi and uh, around abolitionist organizing, right? And there's so much time we could spend focused on the horrors of the Department of Corrections and how they treat um, people inside and, and families and ev everyone else. And we do spend time doing that work, right? But it's also so much about building real deep and long lasting relationships with one another, imagining what the future um, of a world without prisons will look like how do we build um, uh, alternatives to policing that lead and produce prisons, right, um, in our communities? Um, and that is slow work and hard work, and but really um, important and beautiful work that I think is the only way possible to sustain um, us as full human beings, right? I, I think spending all of our time focusing on what we don't want in this world <laughs> Is exhausting. It's not to lose sight of that, right? But I think we have to have so much more, and and um, so many other people have said this so much more beautifully. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I posted a link in here for people who are interested in um, this. Is a volume uh, coming out of lessons from transformative justice, um, and I'm bringing that up. I was thinking about uh, Sharmila, what you were talking about with the kind of people who you know, are seen as unproductive. Um, but this is especially work that's coming out of, I think, disability rights, not even rights, disability justice movement and transformative justice movements about how do we think about accountability and building um, that aren't only about survival, but actually imagining and building, right, the kind of systems we want, um, beginning with those who are seen as unproductive in some ways or as, you know, not fully capable. Um, so that might be a kind of interesting take, I think, and um, that's coming out more, I think, also in um, abolition work um, is building around disability justice. Um, any other thoughts from the panelists on this question? And then uh, Neville has his hand up. Sharmila, go ahead, please. I was just pointing that Neville had his hand up. Sorry, that's all. And uh, uh this isn't an, an, a new thought, but sort of echoing, you know, Carrie and Nicole, what what both of y'all said that, um, it, you know, you know, from my experience and what I'm seeing within, you know, movements and organizing work, you know, in the U.S., um, you know, going back to Nicole, what you were what you were bringing up, um, it is really about that long term visioning. And I know that, you know, in the panel a couple of days ago. Um, uh, Nicole, that you were you were facilitating or moderating, uh, this came up about you know uh, near term work and long term transformative visionary work, and um, that is not about you know just pushing up, pushing back against the right, right? It's about building the building building the the new world that we want, um, and and so you know one of the that to me is work, right? That 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 is that is the work that 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 we're engaged in. It's not necessarily you know uh, Shermila but we're right like the, it, within the model of neoliberal productive uh, work uh, that may necessarily be paid for work, but it is the work of building a new world. Um, and, and I think that 
um, you know, Neville, thank you for your patience. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I think Nicole, your friend or your interlocutor, sort of poses a, the question to me that is at the heart of the difficulty of left politics in this country. Um, and I can make an analogy sort of from queer politics. So somebody like for somebody like Lisa Dugan, the liberals are the enemy. But actually assimilation, co-option, normalization is the problem and that actually it's what's standing in the way of like producing a let me just use a shorthand a sexually freer world and then for somebody like Gail Rubin who I also respect it's the right that's the problem and I kind of think if we're thinking about this on the terrain of work I mean the slide from liberal to neoliberal is not a is a fairly short slide and it's actually, if you like, the technocratic elites are as responsible for outsourcing, um, for a whole range of problems that we face. And so I kind of think this is, this is where one has to be strategic. So like when Trump was in power, I was very happy to get in bed with the liberals. But now that we have a democratic regime, they need to have their feet held to the fire and we need to be yelling and screaming and abusing them. Um, so I, don't th I actually think the, the, the rhetoric of like contain the right provides a nice alibi for liberal and neoliberal depredations of working people. So, so that's what I would say to your friend. I have a strong sense your friend would not listen to a word of that. Uh, so, I, so that's probably not useful because I don't know, you know how, how one gets you know, good hearted liberal people to understand their complicity with injustice in a way that doesn't shame them, I think is, a, is, a, is an important coalition building political question. Uh, and I don't really have answers, but I kind of, so I'm, I suppose I'm saying I'm disagreeing with your friend and that's why. I also have lots of friends like that, so. Unfortunately, I also have lots of family like that. But that's <laughs> yeah, we all do. But the problem is, if you want to contain the right, you have to organize people to fight the right, right? You can't just somehow expect them to wither away. Um, but uh, that's, that's, uh, you might as well organize to make people's lives better at the same time, right? I mean, it's a, it's again, for me, it's a very false notion of, of, of the process that we're all engaged in of, of trying to figure out ways to change the world. I mean, you know, it, it probably takes all of us, you know? <laughs> Um, there's been a lot of uh, work um, being produced by movements. So I wanted to uh, I put that one in about transformative justice. This is a new book um, called The Red Deal, which is by this amazing kind of youth, indigenous youth driven um, collective. And they have, um, it's more of like a manual strategy kind style of book. Um, but I'm, I wanted to emphasize those because I think there is, uh, yeah, our conversations can sometimes uh, remain conceptual. And I think there's actually a lot of interesting, important strategy coming out of movements right now. So um, just wanted to share a couple of those. There's so much more out there. Um, we are also, I, is this the end of the session? I believe 2.30. Um, so I think it is my job as a moderator to thank you all so much for attending. Um, thank you to the panelists as well. Um, I really appreciated, enjoyed, yeah, just the chance to hear from all of you and think across your insights. Um, if any of you have a uh, closing thought you'd like to share, please do. And, and then we'll end the session. Thank you, Pavi, and such a lovely conversation. Like I said, you know, we started off with so many questions about what is care, what is work, and we have more questions now. So you know, that's good. <laughs>
with this event. Um, so thank you again and um, hope to see you at the next pop-up meeting. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>